Okay, uh, I think we're going to start with the first breakout session. Um, this will go to uh, all the way till lunch. Um, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Elaine Ingram. The bacteria. In our compost piles, we want to put in foods that will grow our fungi. And then if we're doing a thermal compost, we want to put in high nitrogen containing materials because that's what's going to start the party. And so in order to generate high enough temperature in our composts, we want to make certain that the growth of the microorganisms is so great that they will release that heat. Think about yourself. When you're doing reproductive processes, is there a little heat involved? And same thing works for these guys, that uh, um, as they start growing very rapidly on that party food, they're going to generate the heat. And we want that temperature to get up around 160, 165 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, about 75 degrees Celsius. And at that point, these organisms are growing so fast that they're going to start using up oxygen. It starts to go anaerobic. So we must turn thermal piles. That means as you're developing your recipe, what percent high nitrogen? What percent green plant material bacterial foods? What percent woody materials, wide sedan ratios, fungal foods? What are those percentages? So that you start to learn that we're going to turn this pile on day two, on day three, day six, day 10, and then we will let the pile cool off and come back to ambient temperatures. We've turned that pile enough times. We've got it up to temperature long enough. All of the material in the pile gets into that hot center, but it's stayed aerobic the whole entire time, making certain that we are getting our bacteria and our fungi and our protozoa and our nematodes. You cannot make good compost if you don't have these organisms in your pile because they're doing the nutrient cycling so that these guys will keep growing on the foods that we've provided the greens, C to N ratio 30 to 1. The woodies, C to N ratio up around 60 or greater. So we have to develop that recipe um, using your materials. Every different kind of plant material is going to have a slightly different set of foods present. And so you're going to have to do some work figuring out that final recipe. Typically, we'll start you um, where we're um, looking at 10% high nitrogen, the party food, 30% green plant material, bacterial food, and 60% woody material for fungi. That's a typical starting recipe when you're doing a thermal pile. Because what we're lacking most in our soils are the things that we have sliced and diced and crushed and destroyed as we're doing the tillage, as we're applying toxic chemicals, as we're putting in organic fertilizers out. So when we're um, using fertilizers, you have any inorganic fertilizer is a salt, and you are killing organisms when you apply that. If you put more than 100 pounds per acre or 100 kilograms per hectare of any inorganic fertilizer, you're killing a lot of your beneficial organisms because you're taking water away from these organisms and they can't live with, without water, just like you. So if we're using inorganic fertilizers, we're wiping these organisms out as well. So we have to avoid, avoid salty materials. A lot of times people will put in really poor quality feedlot manure as their high nitrogen source, extremely high in salts, and your compost never takes off. You never generate the temperature. Well, it's not that... The recipe's bad, it's that, that manure is not really a quality material and you have to avoid those things. So things that you can run into. So in our compost, thermal compost, we have to make sure it stays aerobic. So we're going to turn that pile whenever we get to high enough temperature. We're going to turn the pile whenever the moisture is too low. So we'll add water, maintain your compost pile at 50% moisture and then uh, make sure that it gets turned enough. If you ever stick your thermometer into your pile, and you're gonna stick your thermometer in to measure temperature at least once a day, 
when you pull that thermometer out, smell the tip of the thermometer. And if it smells, you have to turn your pile. It's going anaerobic in the middle of the pile, even though you perhaps have not reached high temperature yet. So making certain that we're getting the good guys. Worm compost is great stuff. You let the worms do the turning. But if you want fungi in your worm compost, you've got to put fungal foods into the worm bin. You've got to be feeding your worms on the surface of your worm compost pile with foods that will select for and grow your good guy fungi. You have to have an inoculum of those organisms. So where are you going to find the inoculum of really good fungi? You've got to go out to that natural system, to that old growth forest, however far away you have to go, Look in the soil and find those fungal strands that you can see, and you take a pinch. You do not take you know, um, kilograms and kilograms and kilograms. You take a pinch, plastic bag. Go find another little strand of fungi. Take a pinch of that soil. You're getting the inoculum of all of those organisms. And then when you get back home, you take that inoculum and spread it out on the surface of your worm compost pile. And the worms come up and eat the bacteria and the fungi and the protozoa and the nematodes. A lot of times those organisms just pass right through the worm's digestive system. And so you're m increasing the diversity of those really beneficial organisms in the compost. Same with your thermal compost. You mix that inoculum at the beginning of the composting process into the pile so you're inoculating those really good organisms. So you can put out solid compost. Thermal compost, worm compost, static compost. I'm not even going to talk about static compost because it takes me about 45 minutes just to explain that. And I, we would probably run out of time. So um, once we have the biology in our compost, then we can extract these organisms from the compost. And if all we do is use water to extract these organisms out of the compost into the water, that's called a compost extract. You may have to extract a lot of compost to get the organisms up to the level that you need to have them to replenish your biology and your soil. So take a look at your soil with a microscope. What's lacking in your soil? And then let's make sure that those organisms are in our compost. And as we extract those organisms using water from the compost, make certain that you get those organisms into the extract so you will replenish the missing set of organisms. If you are prone to foliar diseases, foliar problems, so if you have aphids, if you have whiteflies, if you've got um, you know, coddling moth, if you've got you know, whatever foliar problem, disease, or pest, you're going to want to make a compost tea. If you have um, some nutritional problems above ground. You're seeing some browning on the leaves. You're seeing some yellowing. You're seeing some purpling. Quite often, you can very rapidly deal with that problem by putting out a compost tea on the foliage. You only make tea when you're going to be spraying the top part of your plant, above ground part of your plant. Because we have to get those organisms sticking to the surface of the leaf material, on the branches, on the fruit, on the flowers, whatever part of your plant is suffering disease pressure, we want to make certain that we're getting these competitive organisms out onto the foliar surfaces. So we make a tea. With a compost tea, we're going to again use water to extract the organisms off the surface of the compost, but then we'll add foods to the water to get those bacteria and fungi growing very rapidly. And of course, if you get the bacteria growing, you're going to get your protozoa growing. If you've got nematode eggs in your, and hopefully good guy nematode eggs in your compost, they will hatch in the tea brewing cycle. So about a 24-hour tea brewing cycle when we're at um, you know, uh, summertime temperatures. If it's cooling down in the springtime before it warms up or in the fall as it starts to cool down, you may brew for 48 hours because organisms grow a bit more slowly. But you want to grow, we want to be making those teas at the ambient conditions. You do not grow organisms at a temperature different than where you're going to spray them. 
organisms grow faster when it's warm, so we should brew our teas at, uh, you know, uh, 45 degrees, right, um, Celsius. Mm -hmm. But then you're going to take those organisms that are growing at 45 degrees Celsius and you're going to put them out where it's 12 degrees. Think about if we did that to you. As you've been out in uh, nice warm places and you're running around in your bikinis and your thongs or whatever, and we then instantaneously transport you to uh, outside today, how many of you would survive? Well, neither will your microorganisms. So brew at the temperature of the place you're going to put the organisms. So the things that you're growing in your compost teas are the things that will survive once they get out there. So this is a really brief introduction to compost, compost tea, compost extract. And at this point, I think I turn it over for questions, right? So those of you who have questions from this morning or from this really brief talk, yeah, so I've got about 15 questions from the previous session. Um, I'd like to open it up right now if you guys have any questions right now. Um, uh, go ahead. Yep, so the question is when you're, um, you, have to, you need to brew at ambient conditions and you're taking well water and it could be very cold coming from the ground. So you're going to put it in a, a tank and let it warm up to ambient conditions. That's usually the least expensive way to do it. So you may have to have an extra tank um, in order to always be warming water up and then taking water from that tank that's at ambient temperatures and brewing with that water. Exactly. Um, Bill, I think you were next. You have to be uh, careful about the source of uh, humic materials. So you're going to have to ask some questions of the people who made that product. So if we're looking at leonardite, soft brown coal is where a lot of people will just take the leonardite and grind it up. Well, it's not in a plant available form. It's not even particularly in a easy for the microorganisms to use form. So if you're putting um, ground up humic acid, leonardite, ground up soft brown coal, it can take those microorganisms a good six months to start to digest that material and utilize it as a food resource. A lot of times they will take ground up leonardite and then they will extract that leonardite using extremely strong acids or, and or extremely strong bases and they're extracting through a chemical process the humic acid and the fulvic acid, so humics typically precipitate in alkaline pHs, fulvics precipitate in acidic conditions. So um, they use those strong acids, strong bases to extract those materials. They can collect the solids as they precipitate. They will then put those um, materials back into a pH around seven material usually to get them back into solution. But they are completely de- natured. And the bacteria and fungi can't use them. So bacteria are more likely to use the fulvics. It's only fungi that typically can use the humic acids. Fungi make the enzymes to break down fulvics, or excuse me, both fulvics and humics. Whereas bacteria, um, there are some bacteria that can use fulvic acid, but not as likely for them to be using that material. So it's a good way to select for fungal growth using those materials. But when you've extracted using strong acids and strong bases, that material is denatured, and it's going to take your microorganisms a good six weeks to six months before they can renature that humic and fulvic material. So don't expect a response from those materials for a good six months. Now, how do you get humic acid that your microorganisms can use right now, today? You take your compost and uh, take like a cup of your compost and put it in um, a sieve or put it in, you know, like cheesecloth. Set it on the counter and start running water through that. And typically, if it's really good compost with good humic acid in it, you're going to be able to put about 12 cups of water. 
just, you know, slowly, you know, put it on top and let it passively move through that compost. And what comes out the bottom is going to be a nice, rich, dark brown color. That's your humic acid. That's soluble humic acid. And, and I know there are some people who don't believe that there are soluble, soluble humic acids. And if that's what you believe, then <clears throat> how is it that your microorganisms can utilize that material? It has to be in solution for them to use it. So let's extract the soluble humic acid from our own compost. It's instantly usable by your bacteria and your fungi. Because it's a fungal food, you're going to get fungal growth on that material pretty rapidly. So if you're making a compost tea and you want your fungi to grow in the next 24 hours, what kind of humic acid are you going to go buy? The soluble extracted from your compost material because it's not denatured. The microorganisms don't have to do something to that material in order to renature it so they can use it. So extract your own humic acid from your own compost. Go out and buy some good compost. How do you tell if it's good compost? Remember what I was talking about before? Whip out the old chocolate bar. If it's that nice, dark, rich brown color, you probably have got some pretty good humic acid that you can extract. Now, you've taken all the soluble humic acid out of that cup of compost. What are you going to do with that remnant? You put it back in the compost pile so your microorganisms can start growing on that material again, and they will replenish. They will rebuild. They'll really make the fulvics, the omics, the humic acids that you extracted when you ran water through that compost. Okay, so humic acid, does that answer it? Did I just overwhelm you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the question here, sir? In the first year that you're doing the transition, um, typically we're going to put compost out in the fall and let that work all winter long under the snow because the most rapid growth of the bacteria and fungi is going to occur in the winter under a snow layer because there's free water at the surface. So get that bacteria and fungi growing really fast. And then come springtime as the temperatures warm up, you get all the critters in your soil, the protozoa, the nematodes, all those good guys, wake up and start eating that mass of bacteria and fungi. There's your nutrient cycling to supply the mineral nutrients to your plant as it requires them. So um, we then come in with a compost extract. If we look at our soil and we don't have the biology up to where it needs to be, and if you've put out good compost and you had good foods for your organisms to chew on all winter long, these next steps are not going to be necessary. But how do you know? Get that microscope out. Send a sample to Vivian in Montreal and have her do this work for you. You know whether you are still missing anything. Is it the right balance for the plant you're trying to grow or not? And now let's use the compost extract to get that biology back into the soil so things are going to be not stressful for your plant. Your plant's getting all the nutrients. That castle wall has been built. Nothing's attacking the below ground. So let's get that extract out. So we test the soil. If we need to fix the biology, you'll go out with a compost extract. And an extract's simple because take a bucket of water and you massage a couple pounds of your compost in a bag. You massage it till you get the biology into that water and you go spray that out. It takes you, ooh, 30 minutes to make a really good compost extract, and out you go. So it's easy to, to, to start resuscitating your soil, getting things fine-tuned. So maybe once you check your soil again, okay, maybe you have to put on another application of the compost extract, but by that time, you should really have the biology in your soil. In the first year, 
where you still have lots of diseases and pests and all kinds of problems still in your, you know, the surrounding area and your plant is still being barraged by a lot of those disease and insect and problem situations. The plant's more likely to be resistant to that because it's got the nutrients that it requires, but it still might succumb. You want to be walking through your um, fields, you want to be looking for foliar problems starting to develop. And the instant you start to see some mildew or blight or rust or whatever the problem is above ground, that's where you want to go back and you make a compost tea. And so you apply that when you see the problems above ground. You only make tea when you have to stick the organisms to the surfaces of the leaves. It is the glue that the actively growing bacteria and fungi make on the surfaces of their bodies. So when that drop of water flies through the air and it lands on the leaf, those organisms will instantly stick to the surface of your leaf as that drop of water rolls off your leaf and falls to the ground. Every bit of the way that that drop of water was rolling across the leaf, those organisms were sticking to that surface and covering the surface of that leaf. And then you're still getting some benefit to the soil as that drop of water falls to the surface of your flow, soil. You, you can't apply compost tea to the foliage and not get stuff on the ground. It's not possible. So I, I always like it when people say, well, the foliar applications of toxic materials we're putting on your foliage, it's not going to hurt, hurt any of the organisms in your soil. Oh, really? You <coughs> can apply a mist, a spray, to the above ground part of your plant and somehow mist the soil? Get real. So you are affecting the soil whenever you're putting a spray out. So typically one application. So you start seeing mildew, you start seeing rust, you start seeing a problem, you know, aphids, white flies. A one-time application of compost tea will typically fix the problem. On rare occasions, if your biology isn't really good, you might have to put out another application. Yeah. It's all about the biology in your tea or in your extract. How much extract do I have to put out? Well, if you have really good biology in your extract, you only have to be putting half a gallon per acre. If your biology is not so great, you might have to put out a gallon. If your biology is like, mm, okay, you might have to put out five gallons or 10 gallons or 20 gallons. So you're putting out an appropriate amount of the biology into your soil to replenish the organism you're lacking in your soil. Uh, question right here. So when you're spraying your compost tea, is the pressure that you're spraying the organisms out going to kill some of your organisms? No. Nah. It's not the pressure. So think about it. Um, a person being shot out of the cannon at the state fair, we blow them out. That's not going to hurt him. It's a little bit more acceleration due to gravity, but that's not what's going to kill them. It's when they hit the concrete wall 10 feet away. That's what's going to kill them. So how far are you away from your foliage? And you better be applying your compost tea so the pressure that the organisms land on those leaf surfaces is somewhere around 80 to 100 PSI. So they are gently falling onto that surface. You're not going to kill them. They instantly attach. If you're too close and you're spraying your um, compost tea out at 600 PSI, well, you're going to notice that you're shredding your leaves. And that's a clue that no, this is too high a pressure, back off on your pressure, or walk further away. There are times when we need to be applying these organisms to the top of a 300-foot-tall tree. And we are going to use 6,000 PSI to get the T up there. So, you know, Dutch elm disease, we have to do that. When we're looking at citrus greening, when we're looking at a lot of these foliar disease problems in orchard plants, we've got to use high pressure to get the organisms up to the top of the tree. <clears throat> when we deal with sprayers, the biggest problem is that you forget and leave the filters in the line. And as your compost tea goes through that filter, the organisms accumulate on the surface of the filter. So 
So what's happened to the organisms that you're spraying out? They're all on the surface of your filter. Pull the filter out or otherwise the organisms end up on the filter and they're not going to be going out on the surfaces of your plants. So there's the biggest problem. What kind of pump is pumping the water out and is the passage through that pump killing 99% of the organisms in your tea or extract? Those are what you have to pay attention to. Okay. Um, question here, yeah. sir. Yes, absolutely. The question is, um, Bt corn, does the um, toxin that's being produced um, have an, a negative effect on the soil organisms? Absolutely, and it's been documented. Uh, EPA has known about this from the first year that Bt corn was being tested in um, and looking at it. But, of course, none of you have ever heard of that, have you? That every... BT engineered plant is putting out toxins that are killing your beneficial fungi in your soil. So what's the effect of using a BT GMO plant? You're setting yourself up for some pretty nasty fungal problems. So it's, why would Roundup, why would Monsanto do that to you? Because what are they trying to sell you? So think it through. Um, GMO really puts you right back into the po pocket of the um, biotech industry. You're going to have to buy more of their toxic chemicals. How do you get off that bandwagon? You're going to have to go back and, buy and um, grow heritage plants. And a lot of times when we work with growers and they start growing heritage um, species of corn or um, wheat, or because we have worked with um, BT wheat, um, alfalfa, all of those different kinds, potatoes, um, all of them, we actually get higher yields with our heritage varieties than they do with the genetically engineered. So it is complete and total, uh, I'll be kind this time, mythology that you have to grow um, GMO um, plants in order to make any kind of yield. Absolutely not true. Where do they get away with that kind of advertising? Next question. Uh, right here. In your presentation, you mentioned that you were know, putting either compost, seed or compost extract within your plant. Can you explain how that works in practice? Um, because we're trying to establish that biology on all of the root systems, as soon as the seed germinates and the roots start coming out, we want that protected by our castle wall. We, the exudates are being produced by those roots from the instant those roots are starting to grow into the soil. And we want to make certain all that exudate, all those cakes and cookies, because, you know, when you think about the recipe for an exudate, mostly sugar, a little bit of protein, a little bit of uh, carbohydrate. Isn't that a recipe for different kinds of cakes and cookies? Just as the person who followed me was talking about. So we want the good guy organisms growing on the cakes and cookies not the bad guys. And if we don't have any good organisms, if you're growing, trying to grow plants in dirt, as those roots come out, they're putting out the exudates. It is a genetic um, uh, potential. It is something every plant is going to do. They're going to put out those cakes and cookies. And uh, who are they going to be feeding if you don't have the beneficial organisms in your soil? Yeah, they're going to be feeding the diseases. And now we have uh, a, lot, um, a lot of trouble can happen because of that. So we want those really good guys immediately right around that seed. One of the things you want to think about when you're looking at your seeds, how many of your seeds are treated with fungicide? By law, in the United States, any seed that's sold has to be treated with a fungicide by law. You cannot buy any seed in the United States unless it's organic. That's the only exception. Anything coming from the U.S. has to be treated by fungicide if it's going to be sold. So putting the compost right there on the seed, okay. You probably want to put the exudates, or excuse me, you want to put the extracts or your teas in the soil underneath the seed. We know, and there's been some documentation, that we, that we will kill 
a lot of the biology around that seed when the seed goes into the soil because the fungicide kills way more uh, non-target organisms than just the fungi. So we have to have that compost tea, the compost extract, out here in the soil. So as those roots come through the fungicide zone, they get into the zone where we've got good biology, so now the protective sets of organisms start, can start growing around your roots. Okay, does that answer the question? <coughs> Uh, we got one here from uh, the last one. Do you have an experience with N-fixing bacterial sprays? With what? With nitrogen-fixing bacterial sprays. Nitrogen-fixing bacterial sprays, yeah. Um, if you're dealing with dirt, you probably have to put out those kinds of applications. And I would tend to put it on as a seed dress. Um, you know, so run it through the seed dresser where you've got those um, bacteria. Uh, if you grow uh, compost, if you're making your own compost, rhizobium, azotobacter, azospirillum, azomonas, all the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, both the symbiotic ones as well as the free-living nitrogen fixers, they grow in your compost pile. Rhizobium grows in your compost. It's not a strict symbiont with your plant. It's not like rhizobium can't grow away from your plant. They do just fine growing in your compost. So, take a little bit of the inoculum, put it in your compost, and they multiply madly in your compost. And then make certain that you're um, putting the compost down. I like to make a compost extract and soak my seed in that compost extract. So you're getting not only the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, but all the other microorganisms that you need around that, root, that um, seed. Just be making sure that that seed material has not been treated with a fungicide. So most of those fungicides have an effect on the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So <laughs> you bought something to try to inoculate the nitrogen-fixing bacteria on that seed, but the fungicide's gonna wipe out your nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So <clears throat> think it through. Understand the biology. So free-living nitrogen fixers will grow on the root systems of almost any plant you want to talk about. Um, they are using the exudates, the cakes and cookies, coming from your plant to grow to a high enough number in the soil that free-living nitrogen-fixing organism has to grow to at least a million individuals. So the middle of that colony goes anaerobic. The nitrogen fixation gene is only expressed when you're under low oxygen concentrations. Nitrogen fixation has to be in a pretty much oxygen-free zone for the N2 gas molecule to be split into two separate nitrogen molecules. And then the first thing your plant, your bacterium is going to do with that is to stick two hydrogens onto each of those nitrogen molecules. And then it takes that amide group, the NH2, and sticks it on a sugar, which came from the plant. So that even a free-living nitrogen-fixing bacterium has to have a plant, so it's got enough energy to do this very energetically expensive process of pulling a nitrogen molecule apart. Massive amount of energy required. Nitrogen gas, N2 gas, that's a triple bond between this one nitrogen and the next. Massive energy has to be um, supplied. And so in the enzymes for those nitrogen-fixing bacteria, they have some very specific conditions that have to be met for them to do their job. And we need to make certain that we're allowing those conditions in our soils. Uh, we have a question over here. Um, the um, effects of the negative and positive index effects of using raw manure. You have to look at the quality of your manure. If you're getting manure from a feedlot, look out. Because the foods that are being fed those animals are extremely high in salt and they are usually just under the regulatory levels of heavy metals. So as your animals are eating that pelletized cow chow, um, or you know, chicken chow or llama chow, whatever you're feeding, that pelletized material, usually very high in salts and usually are pretty high in, in heavy metals. 
as it goes through the digestive system of your animal, the heavy metals are going to be concentrated. So what's coming out the other end, that manure, I would kind of encourage you not to use it. Because, so what are you going to use? That's feedlot manure that I'm talking about. Now, how about if you're feeding your animals on pasture? Okay, that's great stuff. Use that. Well, because you're going to bring your animals into the barn. Sooner or later, right? You all bring your animals into the barn. Like, you know, you're going to ship them off to market. So you're bringing them into your barn. Use That's the manure you can collect. If you've got a dairy herd, you're bringing your animals into the barn twice a day. So there's your manure source. So instead of taking all that manure and putting it in a great big uh, manure lagoon, uh, take that fresh manure, something that the animals are not being fed pelletized material. Or if that's the only source you've got of manure is, is from uh, animals that are being fed you know, cow chow all the time, uh, you're going to have to mix that with a lot of orga other organic material um, and get the organisms inoculated that will be able to deal with those high salts level. We can deal with things that have high salt by mixing in a lot of organic matter with the right biology. We can sequester and hold those salts in the structure of the organic matter. So it is possible, but the question, the answer is, pay attention to your source of manure. Make sure that it's not causing you problems in your composting process. So when you're dealing with horse manure, for example, you have to be pretty careful that you're not getting horse manure from an animal that's just been fed with a uh, strongylid, with a um, dewormer. Because dewormers are pretty good at sterilizing things. And so that horse manure coming through the other end is going to have that really uh, antimicrobial agent in it. And you're probably going to have to take that manure and set it aside for at least a year before you can use it because you've got to let that deworming compound get decomposed by the bacteria and fungi. A week after they've been given a deworming medicine, now you can use that horse manure just like any other manure. Be aware of what they're feeding the horses. If it's a stable and they're only being fed horse chow, okay, let's maybe worry about that a little bit. But if they're being fed grains, if they're being fed grass, hey, fine, not a problem. A <clears throat> uh, question over here. You would have to send your manure into those laboratories that will be looking for the heavy metals and um, for what the nutrient concentration is. And, um, you know, so it's, you can do some of that testing yourself to figure out if this feedlot manure has salt problems. Um, a lot of times what I do like to do is just take a really good compost or compost extract and add some of that material into a slurry of the manure and at about 24 hours later, look and see if any of my organisms have survived. They're all dead. How would you interpret that? Now, let's say they've all grown. We put fungi in there, and the fungi are now going bananas. OK, that's probably a perfectly fine manure. So easy ways to test things. If you've got your own microscope, you can be doing all this testing yourself. Uh, John, you got a question? Yeah, I would, um, you know, where, where you're kind of in a transition from chemical agriculture into biological agriculture, I would tend to uh, put the um, inorganic fertilizer out first. Let it do its damage. Um, you know, it's taking water away from my microorganisms in the soil, so that effect is going to happen. So two days later, three days later, come along with your compost extract, your compost tea, and apply it because then you will resuscitate the organisms. You will replenish the organisms that have perhaps been damaged by that inorganic fertilizer. 
If you're only putting on real low levels of inorganic fertilizer, probably don't have to worry that much. It's when you're putting on, you know, uh, 800 pounds per acre of urea. Yeah, uh, you are going to see damage. The salt is going to be pretty rapidly taken up by all the positively and negatively charged organic surfaces that you have in the soil. So the more organic material you have in your soil, the less damage you're going to see from the salts. So they get tied up in other ways than with the water. It's where you're dealing with dirt. That's where the most damage is going to occur with these inorganic fertilizers. So. Once it's uh, been complexed, once it's interacted with water, then the damage is over. So, yeah, it can, it can be taken care of pretty rapidly. But whatever biology is in there with inadequate organic matter, what's, an or what's the adequate level of organic matter in your soil? Hmm. <clears throat> uh, I think Billy you were first and then, then the fell in the blue over there. And you have to remember, it's not just bacteria. Can I beat that into your heads right now? <laughs> bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes, those are, we got to worry about all four of those groups. So when you till, you're slicing and dicing and crushing your fungi, and you basically are going to end up, if, especially if you're rototilling, if you're using the more destructive soil um, structure destroyers, if, if those are the, that's the kind of tillage you're using, you're going to pretty much destroy all your fungi, you're going to destroy your protozoa, you're going to wipe out all your beneficial nematodes. The only nematodes you will have left are the root feeders because they're small enough and they slip in between those small spaces as you're destroying that structure and all you've got is your sand silks, clays, maybe some organic matter. So um, what was the question again? <laughs> Yeah, so as long as your tillage is um, excessive, um, very damaging, cut, cutting things up, you're going to lose your fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. You are probably going to enhance the bacteria because bacteria are tiny. They're very small. As you till, you're selecting four bacterial communities and against the rest of the beneficial food web. So if you're in a strictly bacterial-dominated soil, what kind of plants are you going to be growing? Weeds. You're setting the stage to grow weeds. Any of our other plants that we want to grow require a fungal component to the soil because weeds are the only things that grow with strictly nitrate as their source of inorganic, soluble nitrogen. All of our other vegetables, all of our row crops, all of our trees and shrubs require a significant component of ammonium present in their soil. That is not my research. As research that's been done by many plant physiologists, there are two books that have been written about this. And so we have to get that balance of fungi and bacteria correct. So when we till, we are pushing our systems back to early succession. We are setting the stage for weeds. So why do organic farmers have so much trouble with weeds? They're doing it to themselves. How do you get away from having to use tillage as to, to get rid of your weed problem. You have to build the food web. You got to get the fungi back. You got to get the protozoa back. You got to get the um, um, good guy nematodes back. And then the weeds go away. And I have lots of examples of where we've done that exact thing around the world. We just had a funder that bought a farm for us in California <coughs> so we can do the replicated scientific trials so this, you know, the academic world will start accepting this because a lot of academics like to say, well, Elaine, you've never done the replicated scientific trials. <laughs> well, because I can't find funding. Because uh, who's running the USDA? 
So yeah. I'm going to have to cut you short, Elaine. Sorry. Uh, lunch, lunch is served in the atrium. Can we show it an appreciation? Okay, right, thanks. Thank you. Are you going to be the person doing the questions for the next two sessions? Uh, no, it'll be, it'll be different. Else? But, um, yeah, there's people.